Oh, man. Uh, guys, I, just, I, I love our church. Um, I love our church. Uh, um, God is doing a neat thing in all of our lives together. I love you all. And I really feel like that's been highlighted the past three Sundays. You know, a couple Sundays ago, uh, you know, we handed out these on-mission cards. Uh, we, we had our first mission Sunday uh, where we were sharing what is God doing in the life of the body uh, and locally and internationally as we begin and foster new relationships in India and Kenya and Costa Rica and others. And, and so uh, our family was in Costa Rica then, actually, uh, and we were, we were building a home uh, for a homeless family there and then got to hand that off and see God just pour His grace on both us and them. And it was I mean, it's amazing. We're going to be doing that repetitiously. If we get enough signups uh, this spring on spring break, we'll take a trip there this spring. Uh, so you can uh, email the church about that and get details there. And I was just overwhelmed to hear the stories of, you know, two baptisms here on Sunday. And, and then, then just this past Sunday, uh, as Hilda was sharing and her life growing up in Cameroon and how God is pouring out grace in her life and how she's overflowing with gratitude uh, in the midst of uh, not being able to walk, it was the one thing she shared she, she was most fearing and, and how God is meeting her in grace in that. And, and then um, just a couple days ago, as we're beginning partnership in India, we've got our, our trip planned in India, and Joseph is there serving with his family like crazy. They're doing amazing work, and we'll get to partner with them. He shares uh, with Ronald in our church that you know, five of his friends who have been sharing the gospel in the area that they're sharing the gospel, they were arrested put in the paper, uh, and, then now, and then Joseph uh, shares that he and his family are going to go share the gospel in the, in the very same place. It's like, whew. And then a couple of days later this past week, uh, we hear from Gideon as we're building relationships in Kenya and have taken a couple trip, uh, trip there already, have another one planned, and, and more coming as we uh, support partnership there in Kenya. Uh, he shares of how... Uh, Folks, they're serving there. These families, they're serving there. They, uh, they're basically homeless. Uh, these 70 families have uh, built homes there out of the scraps they've put together. And this past week, the government came in and just literally plowed over all their homes and displaced uh, these 70 families. And uh, Gideon's reaching out to us saying, hey, can you guys help? Um. And that's why we're living on mission together. Uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to paper you with these, these cards uh, through December. But they're not just little cards, you know. Uh, as Gideon says, hey, can you guys help? He, literally, here's what we're saying right now. We're saying, hey, right now, in this moment, financially, we can't, we can't help. But if, if we, us, the church, would give generously in December, then yes, we can. And, and, and Hilda, uh, we said, man, we're, we're going to put funds towards uh, either totally rehauling and fixing the current van, or, or if, if funds really come in, getting a brand new van uh, and, and building relationship with Joseph, Sharon, and, and those families that are being arrested uh, in India as well, and, and sending trips and, and resources repetitiously, and saying to those 70, 70 families, yeah, yeah, man, hey, we're in, here's, here's five, ten thousand bucks, like, we're, we're in, we're here to help. That's what we want to do, right? <laughs> And that's what we're planning on doing is our body gives generously at the end of the year. So here's what we're asking. What's the Lord calling you into? Pray. Pray about it. Uh, what's he calling you to give? Uh, where's he calling you to go? Pray for uh, our missionaries in India, in Kenya, in Costa Rica. Uh, pray. Pray for, uh, like, even at 4 o'clock you can pray as a team goes to Montgomery County Coalition for the Homeless. I pray as we serve our own body and the needs that exist here. Pray. How, how could we be in, involved? How could you be, each one of us, involved? And what might we give then? And then give. I mean, give generously. And we can say, yeah, hey, here's a whole ton of cash towards this. As we build new relationships and partnerships, help these 70 families, help those five families, uh, help continue the relationship with MoCo Homeless, with foster care, uh, foster the family and others. And then go. Would we be a people who go? Would we really go? So look. You're going to get a lot of these cards, or you're going to have probably 15 of them uh, on your kitchen counter come the end of December, and by December 31st, would you and I and all of us have made some decisions to say, how are we going to live on mission with our God? He's doing a mighty work. Why, why, do, we, why do we do this? Because of the passage we just read. The passage we just read. 
We love our God. And out of an overflow of the way He has loved us and our love for Him, we love those around us. Because of who our God is, what He's done for us in Christ, we want our whole lives to be about loving Him and loving others. We're going to look briefly at the core nature of this command that God gives us in loving Him and loving others and ask how it might transform our lives this Advent. So let's get into the text together uh, this morning. We're in Mark chapter 12, verse 28. And one of the scribes comes up to Jesus and, and, and heard them disputing with one another and seeing that Jesus answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? So the scribe comes up, he's been following the Jewish faith closely, he's taking it seriously, he's a scribe, and he sees the Pharisees, the Herodians, and the Sadducees, kind of all enemies of Jesus at this point in Jesus' life. This is the last week of Jesus' life, he's come into Jerusalem, and he's, well, he's spending a lot of time kind of refuting these enemies and the questions they ask him. And the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians are all kind of pouncing on him in this moment. And and Jesus is responding with great wisdom about these different topics. And and in the midst of these last few days of his life, he gives us these, these really core nuggets about what it means to be a Jesus follower, about what it means to be a Christian. And the scribe comes up, he's probably genuinely wondering... Man, what's most important, God? What, what's most important, you, Jesus, here, this scribe? Uh, uh, what's most important about all these laws, all these commandments, all these sacrifices we have? And Jesus is going to answer. Him. And he says, I'll tell you what is most important, what is most core, what's at the center of the nugget, the bullseye, what, what, what being a Christian, what being a, someone who follows God and lives according to his ways, what it's all about. And Jesus answers, the most important is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The simple core of Christianity, the most important thing is loving God and loving others. That's it, Jesus says. And they had made it super confusing, right? There's 613 laws in the Levitical law in Deuteronomy. Uh, 365 of them are negative prohibitions, don't do this. And, and 238 of them are positive, hey, do this. And, and then they've, they've kind of taken all those laws and they've kind of interpreted them in the Mishnah and the Torah and, or Mishnah and the Talmud. And, and they've kind of explained all these different laws. And they've got different categories for them, the, the heavy laws and the light load to bear. And, and it's kind of all gotten pretty confusing confusing how do we please God and this scribe comes and says what's most important you know they've even done things like uh, they they said we got this law about the Sabbath you know uh, and and in the Mishnah and the Talmud they explain uh, we don't want to break the Sabbath we don't want to do any work so can we walk through a field because if I'm walking through a field I might press down a seed it might germinate it might come up and and that might be part of the harvest then have I worked and and can I spit in a field uh, because that might uh, bring water to a seed and it might sprout up and that's work and so they've got all these laws all these things what's most important we want to please you God and Jesus says this love God Simply and love others. That's the core of what being a Christ follower is all about. You know, other rabbis have tried to answer this question. Rabbi Hillel, a famous rabbi, gets his own school uh, about 20 years earlier, has said, uh, in sum, here's what's most important. Don't do to others what you don't want them to do to you. And Jesus says, let's go further. Actually, God cares about the core of loving Him wholly and loving others instinctively, giving all your resources for God and others, giving all yourself for God and others. So how do you think Jesus would have answered this question today? What would He say? What's Christianity all about? What's core? What's central? Attendance. Right? Hey, you got to go to church. That's what Christians do. Christians go to church. So you got to be here and not actually uh, going to church just isn't quite enough. You got to go to community group to make that family meal, make three D's. And when you do a scatter time, make sure you're there. See, being Christian is all about attendance, being there. 
Or maybe, maybe being a Christian, it's all about thinking rightly, right doctrine. We, we got to have it right about who God is, and we got to split every hair and get our doctrines absolutely perfect. That's what being Christian is all about. It's about attending. It's about thinking rightly. And, uh, or, or maybe, no, it's not about that. Uh, what's core is about doing. Maybe you're a doer, right? Like, you've got to be involved in vulnerable children. Otherwise, you're probably not a Christian. If, if you're not involved in social justice and all the inequalities of our world, then, then you're, you're probably not a, a Jesus follower. If you're not doing this, you, if you haven't gone on a mission trip or shared the gospel with your neighbor, you, that's it. You probably aren't a, a Christian. What's, what's core? What's central? Jesus says, love God and love others. Now, that involves all those things, right? I mean, we come here on Sundays, we're refreshed by the gospel, we're compelled, it's important to be here, it's important to be knit into community. Attendance is important, right? Thinking rightly is uh, paramount, of importance. We have to think rightly about who our God is, who He is in Christ, who He is in the Spirit, and, and how that impacts our lives. We have to think rightly, good doctrine, right doctrine matters. It is about doing, it's about responding to who our God is. Christianity is an active thing, but, but Jesus says what's most important, what is core that impacts everything else, every other circle of our life as it ripples out is to love God first and then love others. It's critical to remember. Simple and at its core, it's loving God and loving others, and the order itself is critical. The order of these two commands is critical. Uh, the scribe, you know, asks, hey, what is most important? And Jesus begins with a, a statement, actually, the great Shema, which is, Hear, O Israel, Shema, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Hear, O Israel, we have, there is one true God, and it is our God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit come to rescue and bring salvation, to walk with us in relationship. Uh, it begins with Him, who He is, and what He has done. And then it goes on to, not starting just with who He is and, and what He has done, but then saying, and I love you. I want to live in relationship with you. I want to enjoy a relationship with you. Be shaped by affections for you. Uh, know who I am as I know who you are. I want everything I am to be shaped by everything you are and what you have done, God. I, I want to love you wholly with my life in my mind, in my emotions, in my whole soul, in, in my uh, thinking. In everything capture it all. And then that flows out in loving others the way you have loved me. It's critical, and we can't get this wrong. Uh, John chapter 14, 15 says, If you love me, then it flows into you will obey my commands. It, love leads into living for. Our identity leads into our actions. The indicatives of who we are in Christ lead into the imperatives of how we live that out. First, love him, and let it flow into how we live. If you get this wrong, you will find yourself in joyless begrudgery, kind of half-hearted obedience, which is not pleasing to our God. Yeah, I'll say to my kids, you know, we, Courtney's made this big meal, we're sitting, we're talking, hey, can you guys do the dishwasher? Can you do the dishes? Oh, my gosh, they'll say. Whoa! <laughs> I mean, the things you ask us to do. And then they'll say, fine. And then they'll carry the dishes. And they're like, oh my goodness. Right? And it's like, that's not what I'm after, right? As your father, right? Like, that's not obedience. That's, that's half hearted. That's joyless. That's begrudgery. Like, right? that's not what God desires from us as his children. We can't get the order right. We have to know who our father is, what he's done, how much he's loved us in Christ, and then let our obedience flow out of that. Otherwise, we find ourselves in half-hearted begrudgery. It's not real obedience, not what our Lord desires. Or you'll find, us, find yourself as a legalist, which is to say, I will do in order to please him or manipulate him into accepting and receiving me. Which is to say, yeah, I'm going to care for vulnerable children. I'm going to get it. I'm going to go on a mission trip. I'm going to give my tithe, and, and I'm going to get after this thing. Why? Why? Because then I can say to God, see, when it's time for you to let me in, you ought to let me in because I've done enough. I'm loving enough. I'm tolerant enough. I'm kind enough. I've kept the laws. That's not Christianity either. 
and the order is all wrong. That is, I do in order to be accepted. And, and Christianity is, we've been accepted by a loving God, by grace in Christ. And then we say, oh man, I want to live for you. Or, as a legalist, here's what you'll say. I'm doing all this stuff. What the heck are you guys doing? Covered in pride. I, I am getting after it, oh, serving in this way or that way or going to this or doing that or giving this much. What the heck are you guys doing? And our hearts become hard. The order is critical. Uh, the simple core is loving God and loving others. The order is critical and the two commands are inseparable. They're inseparable. The vertical always results in the horizontal. The two are intimately tied in an inseparable way. You know, it's when Jesus answers. The scribe says, hey, what's the most important of all the commands? And, and Jesus says, what's the most important command? There are two. And then he goes one and two. I love it because the scribe has said, hey, what's the most one important? He's like, I'm Jesus. I'll tell you what's true here. And he's, he, just, he goes with two instead of one. He says, uh, the first is this, love the Lord your God and that with all your holistic self. And, and then the second is love your neighbor as yourself. He presents a simile uh, that we are to do this instinctively in the way we love ourselves so we are to love our neighbor. And the two are inseparable. There's one and there's two. And he gives them both as the greatest command. He'll then answer, this is the greatest commandment, singular, uh, and there is no other like it. They are inseparable in vertical and horizontal ways. Uh, 1 John chapter 4, verses 9, 10 and following, uh, it says just that. In 1 John chapter 4, 7 to 11, he'll say, how can you say that you love God, who you seem, but you don't love your neighbor. He says it does not make any sense that you could know a God who has loved you in the way he has, yet not love your neighbor. You, you can't love him and know his love and not love you. You can't look at Jesus and what he has done to offer you forgiveness and then not offer forgiveness to someone else. That doesn't make sense, Jesus says. The two are inseparable. If, if you're loving God vertically, knowing Him, loving Him, being loved by Him, you will love others because you'll know His love and the way He has pursued each of us. So which quadrant would you fall into if you kind of uh, assessed uh, you're growing in love for God and, and you're growing in love for neighbor? In quadrant run, one, you say, man, I, I'm spending time with the Lord I'm getting to know him. I, you know, you're finding what cultivates your affections for him as you're falling in love with him. It's music or, or walks in the woods or, or reading a thick, good book about him or, or listening to hymns about him or what is it that cultivates your affections for him? You're, you're, you're finding your love for him is growing as you sit with him. You listen to him in his scriptures. You pray and you talk to him. And then you, you find, man, as a result, gosh, I, 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 I'm seeing my love for others. I'm expending my resources. It's becoming more instinctive to give myself away for those around me. When I walk into a room, I decide, how can I use my resources that everyone here can have an improved life? You, if you find yourself in quadrant one, you, you say, man, I'm flour you probably feel it. You're, I'm, I'm flourishing. I mean, it might be super hard. I mean, we hear the Salfo story. There are moments just super hard. But there's a depth of life and of love and knowing Jesus and caring for others that they're experiencing in the midst. Flourishing. Or maybe you're in quadrant two. You're like, oh man, I've, I've hit 365 quiet times. Sat with the Lord every day in my prayer closet. And I'm not loving or caring for anybody. Actually, all I'm doing is hooping and hollering about how amazing I am and how much I love God and you should love God too. And nothing in my life reflects a love for others, a pouring out of myself, a humility, a care. And Well, we would label that quadrant probably hypocrite, hypocritical. That's how the scriptures live. And then, then maybe, though, you're like, man, you're not growing in love with Jesus at all, and you're not loving others. I know that you are then found in that withering quadrant, quadrant three. Or lastly, and I think this is often where a lot of us find ourselves, you're, you're loving others. You're saying, man, I'm going to serve. I'm going to give. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And you're never sitting with the Lord. 
It's Advent season. It's crazy. It's busy. And you haven't sat with him for a week and you don't have any plans to sit with him this week. And you don't know when or where you're going to read. You're like, Advent? What Advent guy? And, and so uh, you're not growing in love at all with Jesus. This is going down and down, but you're going to serve like crazy and you find yourself worn out. Just absolutely worn out. Which quadrant are you in? If I were to summarize the commands, I'd summarize them like this. The first of the two, love God holistically. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Every emotion you have, you try and curb it towards the Lord. In your sadness, you say, Lord, take this, carry this with me. In your joy, you say, oh, I'm so grateful to you, God, in your heart, right? In your your soul, the whole identity of who you are, you say, I'm going to find it in you. I'm at work, but my identity is first in you. You have my soul. You have my whole identity. I love you. I want you to shape it. In your mind, you're thinking, man, I'm not thinking rightly about who you are, God. I, 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 uh, the circumstances are, are reshaping the way I think about you. I, I don't think you're good, and I, I want you to remind me of your goodness, your faithfulness. Or, or you're, you're saying, I want to read good books to go a bit deeper in who, this, uh, who you are in the Scriptures. I want to get into your Word and get to know you deeply. Your mind is being cultivated. And then your strength in response, all you do is being shaped. Right? Love God holistically in some is command number one. Love us, so that should say others instinctively. Love others instinctively is command number two in some. Uh, notice uh, Mark presents a simile here. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself, Jesus says. There's no other commandment greater than these. In the same kind of way you love yourself, as you love yourself, as you walk into a room, no one has to remind you, hey, make sure you're taken care of here. (laughs) Instinctively, it comes to us, right? Hey, make sure you leverage your resources uh, for yourself to make sure you have enough to eat or or, or clothes to wear or or a place to stay. No, we we do this. We leverage ourselves for ourselves. and, And Jesus says, man, leverage that outward. Leverage it instinctively for others everywhere you go. It's the core of the Christian life. The order is critical, and the two commands are inseparable. It's kind of wild, though, right, that this is a command. God says, love me. (laughs) Isn't that weird? If I came home today, it would not go well. If I said, Courtney, love me. Look, I'm your husband. You have to love me, right? That doesn't go well, right? And she would start with, I got 15 reasons not to love you, right? Like, I'm, and that's just from yesterday. But isn't that the joy of this? Here's, here's the reality. God looks at us and there's 15 reasons for him not to love us. We confess just a few of them in confession at the beginning of the service. Uh, but the main is we don't keep this command. We don't love him fully, holistically with our whole lives. We don't love others instinctively with all that we have. We don't leverage our resources. And we have not kept this command vertically or horizontally. But there is one who has. When Jesus comes, every step of the way in a vertical way, he is saying, I want to do what pleases you, Father. He keeps this command for us. His obedience, his love for God flows out in every step of his life all the way to the cross where in obedience and in love for his Father, he climbs on this cross for you and me. And then we see his horizontal love for you and for me when he sacrifices himself in our place. He says, you haven't kept the command, this one or any of them. But Jesus says, you can have my righteousness. My love for the Father can be yours by faith. You can have this sacrifice of my love for you horizontally. This can be taken in your place. The penalty you owe has been paid. That's the love of our God. That is the love of our God that we celebrate every week. This transforms our lives. When we say that's... That's what I want to be central. You, Jesus, are who I want to be central in my life. You are the core of who I am. And I want to start every day there, first to second. I want to start every day knowing and loving and being known by you. And then I want it to be inextricably linked to this idea that I am going to love others the way you have loved me. 
So we come every week and remember, oh, what a great love our Savior has for us. Though we've fallen so short, he's poured out his love for us in Christ, made us sons and daughters. Advent arrived here for us. And if you're trusting in Christ, you can remember his body was broken for you. His blood was spilled for you to make you a son or daughter and change everything about who you are in him. And if you haven't yet received him, would you just receive his love this morning? Don't take communion, but, but take the moment to talk with him and receive the love of the Father poured out for you in the love of the Son as he, he was fully obedient all the way to the cross and as he died in your place to say, here, take this penalty as your own and receive it this morning. And then spend this Advent enjoying who he is. Respond to his love this Advent. Sit with him, whether it be in an Advent guide we, pre- we presented or uh, in the scriptures you read out of Luke chapter 2 or Matthew 1 and 2. Fall in love with him. Remember who he is, what he's done for us. And, and then uh, live in response, on mission, saying, man, yeah, I'm going to give a ton towards this thing. I, and not, I'm just not going to give. I'm going to pray. I'm going to go. I'm going to get involved locally and internationally. The good news of the gospel. Because our God has loved us this way. So when you're ready, be reminded of the great love of your God. His body was broken, his blood was spilled for you to make you a son or daughter by grace.